the only way I can know what is in the mind of God. That's the only way I can know what God expects of me to do to be saved. We've talked about Jeremiah 10.23 before, uh, several times, and uh, which, which teaches us that it's not in man himself that walketh to direct his own steps, right? In other words, I, I can't know by just sitting around somewhere what is right and what's wrong. I, I can't go out and, and sit in, uh, in a boat or uh, up on top of a mountain and go, okay, uh, I know God exists from this creation and from design. We can see that, okay? But I can't say, okay, what does God want me to do to be saved? Okay, there's a difference in general, general revelation and, and specific revelation. General revelation is, is knowing that God exists from creation and design, right? And there must be a God, Declare, declares and demands. We find that in Acts 17 and Romans 1. That's different than specific revelation, where God writes to us this book, which is infallible and has proven, been proven his, uh, through history and archaeological finds and scientific knowledge, foreknowledge, and most of all, most importantly, predictive prophecy that cannot... I was just talking to somebody about this two days ago. Predictive prophecy, when you, when you talk about that, I mean, that, there's no way that this book is a product of man. Okay? If you'd like to know more about that, I'd be happy to discuss that with you. And so when the psalmist is, is declaring these things and putting God's Word way up there, he says, this is what we're striving for. You know, I, I'm reaching for that. I want it. I want to seek it. And, and uh, uh, he's, he's telling us this to help us understand how important it should be in our lives. Okay? And so if the Word of God is not that important in my life, that's why we're here tonight. We're, we're trying to make the Word of God, where, or let it be in my life where it's supposed to be. Okay? Does that make sense? The Word, okay? Oh, man. Are we, I think we spent a lot more time on that than I want to, but that's okay. Um, look, I want you to look at the next one. Maybe you got some more questions. We, could, we can get this. Look at law here. What does the word law mean? Well, I think, was it Bart two weeks ago? He, he said it was something that governed your life, and that's exactly right, and that's the idea here. Law is an idea of code of conduct or rule of action. It governs our thoughts, our words, and our actions. And so there in Psalm 119, back at uh, verse 18, Open my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. Extolling the Word of God, isn't he? Wondrous things from your law. When we think of law, sometimes we think of restriction, uh, restrictive. It's not letting me live my life, you know. Well, the, the problem... If there is a problem that I think that way about God's law, then the problem is not God, okay? The problem is with, is with how I see God, God and His law. The problem is with me if I see it that way, okay? And I'm going to show you in just a second. His commandments are for our own good. Whether we know that or not and see that, they are for our own good. Um, and so the law governs our thoughts, our words, our actions. The New Testament is the law of God today, according to these passages that are right here. Galatians 6, 2. Um, so fulfill the law of Christ. Okay, James 1, 25. It's called the perfect law of liberty. And um, if the, the thing about law is if there is no law, if there's no law of God in our lives, then it would be like the days of the judges. What was going on in the days of the judges? Okay, yeah, so wh where is that? J Judges uh, 17, 6 and 21, 5 both teach us that every man did that which was right in their own eyes. So you've got to have law, and there's other places that teach that as well. Romans teaches that, right? Uh, laws of land even um, is, is, a, is a good thing. Why, is, why are the laws of land a good thing? Well, to keep people from banging down your door and taking everything you own. So... Law's a good thing, right? Um, except for when it violates God's law, of course. Okay? Commandments. So the Word of God is, is law. I want to spend more time on that, but we're going to keep going here. Commandments. All right. God really is mandating something that we can or, or cannot do, a commandment. Um, and this is what I want you to see. And this could really talk about, this could also deal with the um, law as well. Let's read this. This is in Deuteronomy chapter. 6.1, and then we're going to look at 6.24. Uh, 
Deuteronomy 6 is an amazing chapter. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it's dealing with people that have, are getting ready to enter the promised land. And they need God's commands. They need God's law. And he even tells them not just here are the commands and that you should teach them to your children. Start in verse 1 there. He says, now this is the commandment. And these are the statutes and judgments. He uses those two words too, doesn't he? Which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess. All right? And he goes on and continues and discusses, teach them to your children, and so on. Go down to verse 24. Listen to this. And the, uh, and the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God. What's he say next? For our good always, that he might preserve us alive, as it is this day, then it will be righteous for us, righteousness for us, if we are careful to observe all these commandments before the Lord our God as He has commanded us. So there's, He's telling us why God gives commands. Why does He do that? For our own good. And again, if we don't see it that way, we, we've got to come to a point where, where we can where we look at God's law and we say, God's law is, should be so extolled in my life. His commandments, same thing, isn't it? His word, that they're for the better, the benefit, the, the good of my entire life. God, God doesn't want us to, to live a life of, of, um, of uh, non-happiness. Okay? And what I mean by that is, he wants us to be happy. He wants us to be happy looking at life differently than the rest of the world does. Okay? And there's a difference there. And so when I keep God's commandments, I, I can truly be that. Uh, they're for our own good. They're, they're there for us to, to help us do life. Um, Jeremiah 32, 39 says something very similar. Let's look at that. Jeremiah 32 and verse 39 about these commandments, um, the law of God. Jeremiah 32, 39. <clears throat> <clears throat> then I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them. You want what's good for me and my family right now and then what's good for my children as they go through life as well. It's the law of God. It's the Word of God. It's the commandments of God. That's what I want for my children. I, I want them to love it as much as I do. I, I want them to see life so that they may make good decisions. And that's not always easy to instill. It's not always easy for me to even see. But I trust God, and I trust and have faith in Him that it is the best life. Now, 1 John 5, 3 says something very similar about uh, how we look at God's law or His, His, His commands. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not what? Burdensome. When you think of burdensome, what do you think of? What's the idea of burdensome? I'm sorry? Okay, hard, difficult, uh, overbearing, like you can't, you, know, you picture somebody holding the, uh, trying to, to carry something, you know, if you had uh, two 50-pound sacks of something, to, uh, potatoes or something on your shoulders and it's really hard to carry and you're barely walking down the road or something, okay? That's not the picture of God's commandments. It's not like that. In fact, they're, they're liberating. They, they alleviate us from, from the restrictive life of sin. Okay? I didn't say sin wasn't pleasurous. The Bible teaches that it is, but it's only temporary. And true joy and true happiness comes from a life where you're not trying to do just that. You're not trying to, trying to stumble through life bent over because you're carrying all these burdens and this weight. God's commands aren't like that. They're, they're for our own good. Okay, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. All right, I want to just get to this real quick. Do you know what the idea of judgments are? Uh, judgments are the idea... You've heard the phrase, use your best judgment, right? Well, if they're God's judgment, 
then they are absolutely the best judgments. And that's the connotation that this idea of judgments call, uh, carry. Uh, think of these as God's wisdom. Okay? God's judgments will never lead me to make a wrong decision or a wrong determination. They'll always, His wisdom, okay, the way He wants me to live life and make choices, are always going to lead me down the right path. It's the right judgment. You ever heard, uh, well, I made the wrong judgment there, or I made the wrong judgment call. I, it was my judgment. Well, when it is a man's judgment, we do make the wrong decisions sometimes because it's our own wisdom. But when it's God's, it's never wrong. Okay? Testimonies, what's that? Well, if you have a testimony, you have evidence. It's uh, the truth that is based on, on evidence. Okay? And that's, that's the whole idea that the psalmist is saying here. Uh, Psalm 119, again, judgments was in verse 20. 22 says, Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. I've kept your, your word that's based on evidence. It's not just flippant words, you know. It's not just somebody just like other religions of the world where they're just based on hearsay or whatever, okay. These are, these are based on evidence. The Word of God is infallible. You know, the Bible is divine in origin, and there's no doubt about that. Okay, and so everything in this book is based on testimony. Have you ever read the, the verse in 1 Thessalonians 5.21? What's that, what's that say? Test all things and then do what? Hold fast to that which is good. You know, there's a lot of things in this life that might seem okay to, to listen to and hold on to, but do you know how you know for sure? How do we know for sure? You know, somebody, in other words, somebody tells me something in religion or a philosophy or I hear something in a class somewhere, a book or on TV. How do I know, really know for sure if that's the right thing to believe or not? Because the Word of God, right? Check it. Check the Word of God. What's the Word of God say? And if it doesn't back that up, if those principles and those precepts cannot be found in these testimonies, okay, then I've got I to let it go. Okay? What we do then is everything which I believe or uh, have, have been holding has to be founded on the Word of God. If it's not, then I've got to let it go. Let it go. Statutes are not statues, as we said last time. They are fixed. They are determined by God. And then this last one, okay, is counselors. Look at verse 24. <clears throat> Your testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. So God's word are all these things. The last one there, counselors. Um, we have a book that is inspired by the Almighty Creator. Now, He created me, He created you. That, that seems like an elementary statement, right? But I want you to think about it for a moment. If He created us, He created the mind of man, right? So when I have problems with my mind, who should I go to? Our, our Creator. He, he counsels us, right? I understand, you know, sometimes we, we as people, we might need someone to talk to. It's great to have one another, fellowship, okay, and such. I might even have to go to see somebody. But, but the first stop I should make is God, okay? The first counsel I should ask is God because I need help and advice in this life and I can't do it without God's counsel. Isaiah 9 6, what's that say? Remember Isaiah 9 6? He's telling them about this one that's coming. He says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Peace. Father, rather, Prince of Peace. And so, the Bible, the Word of God, counsels us. Isn't it great to have a counselor right here? And so, what we've done tonight, in this brief time period, is to try to put the Bible, the Word of God, where it belongs in our lives. That was our entire objective tonight. And I hope we've done that by seeing how important it is in our lives. It's our direction, our guide, it's infallible. The Word, the Law, the Commandments, the Judgments, the Testimonies, the Statutes, and the Counselors. And we get all that from that one section. Can you imagine what, would, what it would do if we read the whole thing or maybe studied every verse? Can you imagine the gold that you would come out with? All right? Make sense? Okay. I appreciate your attention tonight. Maybe we'll get to continue next time. If not, then uh, maybe we'll get, get to continue again some other time. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Enjoyed it.
All right, if everybody will coming in from their classes, uh, we're going to sing number 622 before we have our devotional this evening. I uh, hope everybody enjoyed their classes and uh, spending some time in God's Word and learning more uh, about Him to build our faith. Uh, we're going to sing number 622, um, and then we will have our devotional this evening. Tell me the story of Jesus. Tell me the story. Good evening. How is everyone? Great week so far? Awesome. I got some thumbs up over here. That's good. That's good. We have uh, been down in Knoxville the first part of the week. Went to take in some of the lectures there at the uh, School of Preaching. And uh, while I was there, the, the theme of the week is from 1 Corinthians and um, united, becoming one in Christ. And so, of course, all those lessons that we've been listening to have been focused on that. And so, as I thought about what I might talk about when uh, filling in for Dennis tonight, um, uh, obviously that was on the, the front of my, my mind. And it was really neat, too. We, uh, we got to see uh, one of the things I love about lectureships, and um, hopefully we can just get a group up and go to some of these. But um, is being able to see people, one, you get to see people you haven't seen in a long time. Um, you get to, to catch up with old friends that, uh, that you've crossed paths with and with in whatever ways. You get to meet some that, uh, that know people right here in the, in the room. Uh, they saw my, saw my hometown on, the, on my badge and said, hey, you know Bart and Lori? I said, well, yeah, a little bit. And um, so it was a point of connection, and we, we stood there and got to talk and, and um, swap stories and, and share the love of Christ with each other, and never got to know these people before. And then you get to meet people from other countries. There are two students there right now getting ready to graduate next month and go back to Australia and continue their, their work in the church there. Got to find out their stories, how they came to be in Knoxville, Tennessee, going to, to preaching school. And you know what the reason was, is, is somebody came in contact with somebody else who belonged to Jesus and wanted to let somebody else know about him and about his church and about the things that he can do for them and what he would have them do in service to him. And here they are, uh, all the way, I don't know how much farther from home you can get, than uh, Knoxville to Australia, but uh, I'd say it's pretty close to the full extent. I, I, my geography is not the greatest, but I'm not paid to do geography, right? So um, same as preachers don't math, except some do. Um, we don't geography either very much, but ultimately the thought that came to my mind is I, I was there, and then we are making our way back and thinking about coming here with all of you tonight. Psalm 133, verse 1, came to my mind and, uh, well, really the whole psalm, but um, in the thought of this here and now, and then when we tie it together with all of the promises of eternity, First Thessalonians chapter 4 particularly, whenever he calls his own and we meet him in the air and the statement that's made there, so shall we ever be with the Lord. No more parting, none of those things. Um, psalm 133 
It says this, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Well, doesn't that sound wonderful? Isn't it a blessing that we have each other here tonight? I look out here and see all of you. I love you. I thank God for you. I couldn't begin to tell you what a blessing that you are to me, to my family. And it's because of the love that we share in and through Jesus the Christ. And he died to give us that. Now, with that said, there may be some sitting here this evening who do not know uh, personally the joy that I'm talking about here. I'm going to give you very quickly a, a quick um, understanding of what is necessary to enter into the fellowship that I'm describing right here. Do you believe that? Do you believe what I've just said, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? That was the confession that that Ethiopian eunuch made in Acts chapter 8. You get down to verse 37 and he, he recognizes that, hey, here's a good place for me to obey the gospel. What, what hinders me from being baptized? He says, if you believe. He says, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Do you believe that? Would you confess it as he did? Do you believe it to the point that it would drive you to turn away from whatever sinful things are in your life? Those sins that are dividing you from the fellowship with the Father and the Son and his people that we read about in 1 John 1. Would you turn away from that? Would you repent of those things? Because that's the first thing Peter said in Acts chapter 2, in verse 38, in responding to those who were cut to the heart when they realized that they had been a party to the crucifixion of, of our Lord. They said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he said, repent. Would you do that? Would you do it tonight for this good and pleasant fellowship that we're a part of? And would you be buried with Christ through baptism into his death? Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, raised to walk in newness of life. If you'll do that, he will add you to his church. He will add you to this fellowship that we get to enjoy. And it can be for you the blessing, life forevermore. That's the Lord's invitation. If you have not done that yet, won't you do it tonight? If you have, but you've walked away, you don't live uh, in a good and pleasant way with your brethren or with the Lord. Won't you come make that right? The beauty of the blood of Christ is it can cleanse you again like it did the first time. Whatever you need to do, be a part of this blessed fellowship that we have. Right now, as together we stand and as we sing.
hope everyone has had a good week so far. I know uh, we had a great Bible study here in the auditorium. I trust uh, that you had good uh, Bible studies in your classes this evening. I want to welcome our visitors. We have several visitors with us, and please know you're our honored guest and come back anytime to have the opportunity. Please leave a record of your visit with us that uh, we might have um, a re record of that. It's sad to announce the passing of Ernie Horton. Uh, Ernie passed away Monday morning early, and uh, very unexpectedly, and uh, we want to remember, obviously, Janie in our prayers. Um, the funeral arrangements at this time are still incomplete, uh, but it's going to most likely be sometime in June, and it's going to be in Texas. Um, Janie tells me that they are planning possibly a celebration of life um, for him sometime when they get back, and that will be later on, uh, maybe in July or sometime, but that's all uh, incomplete uh, at this time. So let's please remember uh, Janie and Linda Bode, Linda Alt, in our prayers, uh, the passing of Ernie. Donald Prevett is still undergoing some tests. He was at the doctor's office today, and uh, they're still undecided what's exactly going on. He's seeing a cardiologist uh, as well, so please keep Donald in your prayers, um, along with Francia Amante and Loretta Rainbow and others that are asking for our prayers. Helen Tigg has been moved to Hillview. Uh, she is in room 2B. Jean Whitlow, this is Melinda Elliott's father, is uh, still in critical condition. He is improving slightly. Uh, he is still in the ICU unit there in Moore, Oklahoma. My sister Annie LaFollette is still battling her pneumonia. Uh, she is not much better, to be honest with you. Uh, she lives in Talbot, Tennessee. And my nephew David LaFollette underwent his surgery uh, Monday where he was airlifted to the UT Medical Center. Um, he went through ex extensive surgery. Uh, to repair lungs and ribs and collarbone and his neck. Um, so that's going to be a long recovery. He should be coming home hopefully in the next day or so. Uh, please remember David LaFollette in your prayers. Donda Plyer, this is a friend of Tamara Taylor's, um, has been diagnosed with stage four cancer um, and it's uh, not looking good for her. And, Tamara is requesting prayers on her behalf and the family uh, as well, and we'll get you an address uh, for them at um, hopefully by Sunday. Are there any others that I need to place on our sick list? Okay, group five, uh, that is our youth group. You'll be meeting Sunday evening after services. Please remember that, all the youth, uh, group five. There's going to be a preteen fellowship in the annex this coming Sunday afternoon at 4.30. Uh, and please see Ingrid Gully for information about that or if you have questions about it. And Ingrid tells me she put a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board out here uh, for the preteens and those that were planning on attending. Uh, they would like to get a head count. Our own gospel meeting with Brother B.J. Clark, can you believe, is just two and a half weeks away. Uh, it doesn't seem real, but uh, I know a lot of excitement about that and looking forward to that. Recently, there are some new YouTube videos that uh, B.J. Clark has uploaded through the GBN Broadcast Network. You might want to go on and see some of those. They are really good. The teen retreat coming up at High Rock Bible Camp, uh, that starts Friday. So uh, teens, take your blanket, uh, a good heavy sleeping bag. <laughs> You're going to need it. Uh, I know you'll have a good time and great fun and a lot of good fellowship will be there. Game night at the McCain's house and potluck dinner, uh, May the 5th, starts at 6 p.m. Uh, the spring formal in lieu of the prom uh, at the side porch, May the 6th. Uh, please see Kelly tonight if you're planning on attending. She'd like to have a head count for that. Um, mac, macaroni and cheese, mac and cheese, macaroni and cheese is all I have on the uh, agenda for the pantry item for today. Todd, we don't call on you to lead closing prayer very often, but I'd like to have you lead closing prayer for us tonight. Let's all stand and we'll have a verse of a closing song and be dismissed in prayer. Our last song this evening will be number 387. 
Lead me We pray with me. Father, we come to you at this time with heavy hearts and thankful hearts all at the same time. Father, our hearts are heavy for the passing of our good brother, Ernie Horton. We pray, Lord, that you will bless Janie as she adjusts to this new way of life. And uh, we pray that you will uh, just be with her, give her strength to endure those things, to, uh, to adapt to those changes. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to be the support that we need to be for her in, in the days ahead. Father, we're so thankful at the same time, though, for the hope that Ernie lived in and that Janie has, that we all have, through the blood of your son, through the, the promise that we have that if we are faithful to you through him, that he uh, will save us from those sins, that he has washed those sins away, and that we can spend our eternity with you. We pray as we leave this place, Father, that we will find some soul to share that good news with, that we will have the courage to do so, the wisdom to know how. We pray, Father, that you will just bless us with uh, pure hearts, that you will forgive us our sins and help us to conquer those temptations in our own lives, that, that we will walk closer with you day by day. We thank you for the health that we enjoy, and we pray you'll continue to bless us with that. We pray for those who are having struggles with their health, that you will, if it be your will, that you will give them healing, that you will let them be restored or that they will be able to endure those things and to do so uh, living in faith and, and the hope of a glorified body that doesn't go through these things. Father, we pray that you will deliver us home safely tonight, give us safe travels, and if it be your will, give us another day in your service tomorrow. We pray you'll help us to use that day better than we have this one and to do so each day of our lives. Lord, we ask all of this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.